All right, so, uh, so introductions, I guess. I'm Ethan Watson, a senior generalist programmer at uh, Remedy Entertainment. Um, if you don't know who we are, we are known for uh, such video games as Max Payne, uh, Alan Wake, and uh, as of uh, about 29, 30 days ago, Quantum Break. Um, anybody played the games here? We got some fans? Yes, yes, fans all over the place. Excellent, that makes my job easier. Okay, so uh, as the uh, slide implies there, this is a talk about AAA gaming with some decode. I will be uh, talking about our usage of D in Quantum Break, uh, some of the problems we encountered along the way, and things uh, we would like to do in the future with D. And uh, this talk, uh, has a couple of key areas that we'll cover. Uh, the first one is integrating D into our primarily C++ code base. Uh, we'll cover a major use case uh, of uh, D in Quantum Break. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how we got it shipped on the Universal Windows platform for the Windows Store, and uh, like I said, where we would like to go with the future with D. All right, so a little bit more information about Quantum Break uh, for those not in the know. Um, it is a cinematic action game uh, where you have to stop time from breaking down, and you do this with your own time-based superpowers and guns. Uh, that's how it works. Um, uh, <laughs> you can solve everything with a bullet. That's a remedy game. Uh, it also has an integrated television show component, which makes it fairly unique as far as video games uh, go. Um, and on the week release, we're number one in eight countries. Uh, it's the biggest news selling IP uh, from Microsoft this console generation. And yes, we use D-Code in it. D-Man, yeah. I like D-Man. OK, so uh, first things uh, we need to talk about is integrating D into uh, our game engine. Uh, like I was saying, uh, we are more of a traditional, very heavy C++ engine. Uh, to integrate it, we took a uh, different and interesting approach to what normal people do. Back in 2013, uh, Manu down there uh, presented a talk at the uh, first D conference uh, using D alongside a game engine. Um, it, it basically covered the systems he set up before he had to leave Remedy, in which I subsequently took over. Uh, this talk does assume knowledge of that uh, presentation, uh, but for the sake of those that have not watched it, I'll just give a little bit of a brief overview of the uh, systems that were set up there. Now, now D's usage in our code base uh, came about because programmers uh, wanted a rapid iteration system. Instead of using a scripting language, uh, they dis uh, decided that they wanted to use a compiled language in a DLL that would uh, hot reload. Uh, so that effectively meant that uh, a term that's uh, in use in games industries at the moment is code as data. So it's the same thing like you'd have textures or meshes or whatever uh, it gets processed into a uh, format native for the platform you're running on. Same deal with code. Our asset process is run over it, generated as a DLL. Uh, and uh, we run that final binary form as code. Uh, to facilitate that, uh, because we have a ton of C++ code, it was very critical for us uh, to be able to link backwards and forwards, both from C++ and D. They needed to intercommunicate. And uh, yeah, we, we, uh, because we needed to hot reload, we settled on a dynamic binding system. Uh, which basically required a bunch of defines to expose functions in C++. Uh, but for D, we use uh, language features, uh, su uh, such as uh, uh, reflection uh, uh, and user-defined attributes to uh, automatically generate those bindings for us. Um, and yeah, we needed to be able to reload. Uh, so as a part of those language features, uh, we have uh, a parser that goes over all of our da data structures used in D and generates code that serializes, that serializes from JSON. Uh, we do a reload of the DLL, uh, serializes from JSON back into native D objects, uh, which solves a whole bunch of problems, such as binary matching is not a problem. You, we use a, a, you know, a naming of uh, variables gathered from our compiled time parsing to match up the variables that need to be uh, deserialized. Uh, it's a pretty useful system. Um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is a bit weird, because I, um, I came from a world of C++ programming. Uh, I not looked at D, basically, before I got into Remedy. 
Um, and uh, the first time I programmed uh, Remedy, uh, uh, DE code was at an internal game jam we had. I read uh, Andre's uh, introduction to the D language book, uh, just the introductory chapter the night before I started programming it. And you know, the language itself uh, had a lot of similarities in, uh, to C sharp. I was able to pick it up and get something up and running really quickly. So uh, th that I kind of liked. Um, but the compile time features that I would need to learn to take over Manu's code, I was like, that can't be that hard, that right? And no, it, it's, it was really, really difficult. Uh, no, not so much the um, uh, like static ifs and normal templates, compile time function evaluation, all that stuff is nice and easy. Uh, but the nature of the code uh, for uh, doing all the automatic serialization, all that, uh, very deeply nested mixed-in templates, uh, string generation uh, being mixed in, uh, treated as code. Um, it, it was a, when I wrote the uh, code three years ago, about three years ago now. It was it was a pain uh, because uh, the compiler wouldn't really give meaningful debug messages when something went wrong. It, it, I, I do not joke when I said it would take me a day to work out what some of these problems were. You know, it'd have to, you know, pragma message uh, the generated code out to the debug window so I can work out uh, what, li what it actually thought was going wrong. And the main problem there was that line numbers did not match in any meaningful sense. Um, I have no idea if that's any different these days. This code's been working for a very long time, uh, so, so I haven't needed to come up across any more problems with it. Uh, but, but yeah, that, that was, um, it, once I got all that done, I mean, I'm straight up a convert. Um, I would rather be programming in D than C++. Um, and that's solely down to the compile time features. Uh, I mean, like if you compare D to emerging languages like Swift, Rust, Go, um, the features are either non-existent or nowhere near the level that D is operating at. Um, and uh, I plan on doing another talk in the future targeted specifically towards game developers, and I will be p uh, pushing the compile time features as a result uh, to try and get more people to pick it up. All right, so there's one major problem that came up uh, if, with the uh, binding system that Manu did not cover in his talk, uh, and that was versioning. Uh, if, normally with, a, with your data uh, in, a game, in a game development environment, if it's just a texture, we have additional metadata that versions it. It all matches up nicely to code structures. Uh, it gets converted from there into a binary form that the engine can uh, read at uh, runtime. Um, and we have fairly automatic ways of dealing with that uh, if it's data. Um, you, don't, you don't really have that luxury with code, though. Um, when you change a function prototype, there's no two ways about it. Your DLL is not going to work. Uh, so I took a similar approach to versioning just plain old normal data there. Um, I marked up functions and interfaces with version numbers. Um, so that, that was uh, pretty simple to implement. Uh, you just mark up uh, with your export and import user-defined attributes uh, a little version number inside of it. Uh, and then when you go through and you load up uh, your functions, um, you, you mash the versions together. If they don't match, your DLL doesn't load. And it does have the nice side effect of solving Windows DLL hell. We never had to worry about uh, loading up a DLL that was wrong at all, thanks to this system. All right. Um, this this uh, is a slight problem, though, that we never solved. Um, uh, the problem when you change a uh, function signature is that your, your C++ code builds then absolutely need to be in sync uh, with the D code we have. It's as, it's as data. So, um, uh, you know, it basically, um, uh, just, just a bit of an idea of our company structure. This is true for game development studios as well. The number of programmers we have in there is outnumbered by something like seven to one to, uh, for everybody else that is involved in game development. You know, designers, uh, level builders, uh, texture, texture artists, master artists, uh, everything there, outnumbered seven to one. Uh, so, so treating uh, the code as data meant that um, and you ship it out to the data guys, they're all happy. But if you have decode, uh, but if you have a change in the function signatures, you need a new code build to do that. And that, that proved to be a little bit of a pain uh, for programmers. The, the system uh, we, I came up with and never got a better solution up and running for uh, was that uh, stagger submitting the decode. Effectively, uh, you had to uh, shelve the decode, uh, submit your C++ code, 
email the programming team saying, guys, I've just submitted new uh, D code. That, uh, I mean, I've just submitted new C++ code that needs this D uh, code. Unshell it so you can continue working. And then when the publisher has gone through and everybody has access to the new binaries, only then do you submit the D code. Um, so that, that was... Uh, it was not, not the greatest. I mean, it was uh, fairly uh, pain-free for uh, everybody else. They, they didn't notice. But programmers, it was a significant uh, workflow problem. I mean, uh, you know, you'd still, you'd still have issues where data guys would be like, uh, you know, this doesn't work. And it's because they didn't get the new code build. So it's, it's not completely seamless. There's still the human error factor involved there. Um, now, when we say code is data, there are two other major engines out there uh, that, that, uh, that are using this paradigm, and that's Unreal and uh, Unity. Um, they don't really have this same problem. Uh, they've basically gone whole hog with the code as data approach. They have engine releases, and everything you can ever do with them is treated as data. Uh, so as far as versioning goes from there, you get a new engine release. They release it well, every few months or something. And at that point, the person who is in charge of getting that engine release uh, upgrades the code uh, to make sure it works with the new engine. Um, so uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Um, that I think there's a better solution for us. Uh, at least while we're still very heavily C++, most of our game logic is still in C++. Uh, I don't have a solution for it yet, uh, but it is something I'll be looking for, uh, looking uh, to into the very near future. All right. So there was uh, one other interesting uh, use case for uh, mixing C++ and D that came up. Um, basically, uh, there's a little debugging structure that we've uh, had running for years uh, in C++ that spits out some, uh, it basically plots uh, points on a graph so that you can see things in real time. Uh, and uh, one of the guys needed this in D. Now, uh, the way the uh, pipeline had been set up before that was that, oh, you need a new C++ object, so you allocate it in C++, you pass the pointer along to D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is basically introducing a huge amount of co code complexity for what was little more than a debugging feature that was going to be compiled out for the full game. And uh, that, that, that just wouldn't fly with me. I didn't think that was a very good solution at all. So I took a different approach, uh, and that was, um, uh, this example I've started up here is a heavily uh, uh, cut down example of the actual code structure. A uh, bit of modification and extrapolation. Our code doesn't look exactly like this. Um, but you basically start out, uh, you use the binary compatibility between C++ and destructs. We strip out uh, all the, uh, I started by copy pasting the C++ definition, stripping out all the functions, all the other declarations so that I just had a matching binary struct. Moving along then, you then had to bring the functions back into that we were going to use. The import label up there tells the system to go through and parse, and that's a function it will resolve from C++. The finals down there are D wrapper functions that take native D types and split, split them out into a C++ format that it can understand. Um, and from that point, uh, you can just instantiate your normal uh, D objects. Uh, you embed a copy of that struct there, and in it goes. It is a C++ structure uh, that was uh, a purely instantiated in D with a binary match. And uh, we were using our C++ functions on it as a result. Significant cut down in code complexity. But it also has some heavy implications with it. Um, as I was talking about with our auto serializer, it does compile time parsing of all that. That mix in export class there is something we have to define for each class at the moment uh, to expose it to the auto serialization capabilities. But it also, uh, when parsing over an object, goes through into structs automatically and uh, creates a description of those structs. So what it effectively meant uh, was that we had um, free auto serialization of our C++ objects. Um, and that, that, that was just something that I never realized we can do until I sat down and did it, and oh my god, it just works. Uh, and that, that opens some very heavy implications there, not just mixing C++ and D code, but now it basically means there's a full suite of things that you no longer need to do in C++. For example, our reflection system, which in C++ looks a little bit like this. 
This is, a, again, a cut-down version of the same class, but this is our C++ definition. You still have the data up there, but then you've got this thing there, which is the OSP blocks, the uh, object stream processor. Uh, that, that's basically embedding uh, a reflection data into our C++ classes uh, for us. There's a whole bunch of templates and other magic hidden behind those defines there. Uh, the versions, as you can see, that it's, it matches up. Oh, we've got a question. Uh, can we get a... Can you please, is it possible to increase the font size of the uh, I don't know. Is there a zoom feature on this? Uh, I don't think there's... I can't see a zoom feature. Sorry about that. Um, if, yeah, I'm not sure what to do for you there. Sorry. Um, uh, but where was I? Yeah, um, it, that, that all exports data, uh, you know, reflection data, so that we can then have objects parse over it. And uh, one of the big bugbears of mine, though, is that um, this little OSP define thing down there is something additional you need to define in a CPP file. It, it basically initializes all these static objects inside that class that we've had to put in uh, to get these runtime reflection capabilities. Um, uh, one of the bugbears of mine there is thanks to templates in C++. You have to do one of these defines uh, for your templated type with the template parameters for each and every single parameter you're going to use. It is not at all an ideal system for maintenance. Uh, we use uh, the OSP stuff heavily for, uh, uh, for content in game. Um, and we had intended to just have all these OSP defines in one CPP file, but we hit nat natural limits in the compiler, so we've got to split it up over like I don't know, five or 10 CPP CPPs at the moment. It's a bit, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a nuts uh, system thanks to C++, uh, but with this setup that I stumbled upon in D, it means we can effectively get rid of all this boilerplate code and just let all the D code do what we traditionally do in C++ and not have to change anything else about our C++ code. Uh, that's not something I, uh, we're doing at the moment, but it is something I would like to put heavy research into in the future. So, sorry, sorry about the uh, code size there. Uh, the slides will be available after this, so you can have an extra look. All right, so um, D gives us all this uh, cool stuff. I'm, I'm happy with D. It's great. I would rather be programming it in D than C++. Uh, it's only one thing that was getting in the way of uh, other programmers actually picking up D on our project, and that was actually the binding system itself that we had set up. Now, the, uh, the, the way it works is that you know, we, we didn't just go through and expose everything to decode immediately, because that's a ton of work. Uh, it, it would require the first person who needed uh, access uh, to C++ code indeed to go through and set up the bindings. And uh, that, that was a bit of a process, because uh, you'd have to go through, work out the functions, uh, expose them all, write a corresponding interface in D that imports them all. Uh, and, then, and then you'd have to do uh, something of a, a staggered code release for that as well, because you couldn't submit your new D code until it existed in a build uh, that, was, uh, that could be used by everybody. Uh, so that, that was you know, at least a 30-minute process to go through that. Um, and what it generally came down to is uh, people not having the time or uh, things were busy, whatever the reason, they just couldn't sit down and do that bit of maintenance work. Uh, so it, they just do the same cut tasks they were about to do in C++. Five minutes later, submit it to the code repository. If people want that functionality, they needed a new code build anyway. Uh, so so uh, that, that was uh, not, not particularly ideal there. It resulted in um, not, not many people using D. Uh, and that is, is something of a catch-22. Um, uh, doing things with plugins, uh, it sure, it meant you had access to a rapid prototyping system, uh, but then setting it up was a time sink. So uh, because they didn't have the time for it, not many people used it. Because not many people used it, uh, I, I, there was uh, like, you know, my responsibilities aren't just D at Remedy. Um, I, it generally turned out that I had something more pressing or more important than I needed to do than to uh, do some work to fix these problems so that more people could use D. And it's, it's a big loop of uh, the circular dependencies, or a catch-22, as I've summed it up. Uh, so that, that was a bit of a pain, because it had the impression of D being hard to use. Uh, but that's not the case at all. And that's, uh, it's worth pointing out explicitly that it is, in fact, a problem with our uh, plug-in and binding system, and not the language itself. 
Um, it, our, the plugin system, in fact, was designed in a language agnostic manner. Uh, the fallback plan, if we couldn't use D for whatever reason, was to do the same thing with C++. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, we would have had an even bigger problem then because the boilerplate code you needed to done would have been significantly increased and definitely nobody would have used it then. Uh, so. Some of the boilerplate uh, stuff can be solved uh, thanks to D's compile time features. Uh, for, like uh, we give it a C++ header file. We let the uh, we get uh, D to do some compile time parsing of it. We make it spit out a matching D struct and, and automatic bindings, and uh, that that will basically remove uh, the maintenance cost on the D side of the fence. But there's still the issue of exposing functionality from C++. Uh, so uh, while I do have half a solution that will, in fact, be tricky to implement in itself, I don't have a full solution for it yet. And it is something that I do need to uh, put a bit of time into. Now, I did just go on about how you know not many people were picking up whatever, whatever. We do have a major use case uh, of D in our code base. Um, now, our animation programmers, in fact, ended up using the system exactly as it was designed for. Um, so the middleware we use for Quantum Break is called Morpheme. Um, I'm, I'm not sure anybody here would be familiar with that, but it's, it's an animation suite uh, used in games, used in film. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of big. Um, so the way we had it set up was that the animations would uh, respond to messages or events given to it by code. Uh, this, uh, the animation would then go off and respond to that. A lot of logic was in the animation networks. Um, so it, it uh, basically required, I mean, getting information out of the Morpheme network was the same. It, it needed to read it and put it into code constructs. And uh, it basically meant the code and data needed to be in complete sync. If an animation changed and it changed the parameters, the events, the tags, whatever, it needed to be in immediate sync with the code. Now, this ended up being a problem at some point uh, because our build system was uh, undergoing a re-implementation. And uh, it, they were, it was really slow to begin with. A turnaround time for a new code build would be something like a day. Uh, we've got it down to like 20 or 30 minutes at the moment. Um, but that, that was especially bad when it came to animation. It, it made massive workflow problems. Any animator working on a character would just have to stop work for a day while they waited for a new code build to come out before they could submit it, because as soon as they'd submit it, other people would get it, and they'd have a problem. Um, the, uh, alternate solutions uh, involved trying to get the code in a day early, so we knew what the animators were going to put in their network, and we just submitted a day early, which then led to telling the programmers, guys, don't sync code, or if you do, roll back this certain change list. It was uh, in no way a good solo solution. And well, clearly something needed to be done. So uh, the, the uh, animation code as it was written, uh, it, it supported precisely one kind of setup. Uh, that was a fully-fledged controllable character. Uh, a fully-fledged controllable character in our system is quite a heavyweight object, not just in terms of the data used, uh, but in terms of the code. Uh, our code uh, tried to be written originally in something resembling a component-based manner. Uh, we had stuff wrapped up in these things called features. But every character everywhere had the same features. Uh, we did not select them uh, uh, through whatever criteria at all. Every character just always had one of these. Uh, so uh, part of the cleanup for that was that the uh, animators wanted to move to a more flexible component-based system. And while they were at it, they wanted to get around the uh, problem I was just describing there with the uh, day times, uh, uh, the day build times. So it was like, well, why not D? So. Uh, we ended up moving over to D. And uh, with me being the uh, resident D guy in our company, I ended up uh, implementing the solution uh, that they still use and shipped the game with. Uh, so th the first thing I needed to do, uh, being a component-based thing, I went through and wrote a very lightweight component system in D. You have, it's basically, when I say a component system, it's a container for a collection of components that follow a certain set of rules. Uh, and uh, it, that I needed to write in a generic manner, the intention being that other areas of code would reuse it. Animation needed some extra stuff, so I uh, extended that class and specialized it for the animation needs. <clears throat> 
All right, so uh, once that was uh, up and running, I then had to go through and manually port uh, C++ code to D components. Uh, like, like I was saying, the features were already there, so they could come over. They weren't exactly fine-grained enough, so I had to split uh, them out into smaller components. Uh, there was one particular area that was this massive, like, 500-line function that did a whole bunch of management on the uh, animation network there. Uh, when I ported that over to D without any syntax, I mean, like, with just the relevant syntax changes to get it up and running and make sure the code was compiling, <laughs> ended up finding uh, the D compile times went from a, a couple of seconds to 30 seconds, and solely because of this massive function. Um, splitting it back down into the, you know, it, compartmentalized components that were with the relevant features into them. Uh, solved that problem anyway, so I don't know if that would still be a problem with the DMD compiler, but it was a few years ago when I reset that up. Um, all right, so once we had that all up and running and I proved that it worked, uh, we took a bit of a staggered rollout, um, set the code up in such a way that uh, the C++ code remained, and if it could find a D, the D code, uh, it would run with that instead. And it quickly became pro apparent that uh, there, there were no real problems there. Uh, so that, that basically meant, you know, a couple of weeks, I think it might have been a month later we ended up doing it, we just hit the delete key on all the C++ code. It was gone, goodbye, you won't be missed, yay, it was great. It's satisfying deleting C++ code in favor of D, let me tell you. <laughs> All right, so, um, and, then, uh, and then, like I said, it just started becoming uh, used exactly as we intended. Uh, you'd submit the D code with the new character. The programmer would speak to the animator. OK, cool, I'm about to submit this. OK, cool, I've got the code for this. All gets submitted at once. No real problems. The only, again, uh, if, a function, if a function signature changed, you'd still have that little bit of maintenance work there. But uh, otherwise, it just became a regular occurrence. So if there was a bug in the code, it didn't mean shipping out a whole new code build. It would just be like, here we go, here's some new D code, and it just works. So that worked out uh, to be quite a win for them. All right, so that, that basically meant that we had D in use in a very critical subsystem. I mean, let, let's put it this way. If you don't have this D code here, character doesn't move, character doesn't respond, you can do nothing in the game. So, so that meant that now that we had this system set up, we, we needed to absolutely make sure uh, that our D solution was ready to be shipped in a retail product. Um, now, we uh, shipped on two platforms for Quantum Break. We shipped on Xbox One and uh, the Universal Windows platform for Windows 10. Um, I'll, I'll go into some of the specifics now that we had to deal with. Um, uh, first, it needs to be said that uh, thanks to Walter's support back in the day, we were able to ensure that we can compile for Xbox One. Uh, so that, that, that was critical step number one. If, if we could not compile for uh, our main platform, there was no way we were going to use D. So uh, it, it, once we have the language compiling, et cetera, it's just all the other runtime stuff we have to worry about. Uh, first thing uh, we need to worry about as game developers is memory management. Uh, we, if you're running on a console or even a mobile phone, uh, at least earlier days, uh, it's very definitely an embedded environment. Um, we, we really need to keep a track of memory, have an idea of what it's doing. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that that I will slightly get into the specifics to in a little bit. Uh, but we definitely need to know where it's going. So uh, that meant I needed to go through the D runtime and uh, work out where it was allocating memory outside of the garbage collector. And there's a few places that it does that using the uh, standard C allocation functions, uh, alloc, calloc, realloc, and free. Um, I also found one instance of alloc A, which allocates memory on the stack, and that was in the uh, float to string conversion. But uh, that, that, one, that one was actually fine. We didn't need to worry about that, because being a stack allocation, it immediately cleans itself up after you're done. So that, that was all fairly well and good. Now, uh, the, the approach I took for replacing it, uh, we, like we basically need the, the, where that is called to hook into our own internal memory allocation functions so we can track it correctly. Um, now, uh, D comes with uh, the garbage uh, collector separated, and it does all its allocation functions in there. So the approach I took was, uh, if you're going to override a function, that would be the most logical place to put it. So uh, inside our uh, little garbage collector uh, uh, file, we, I've got a couple of functions there that match the ones used uh, from the C runtime. And I've just called them GC, raw, alloc, calloc, realloc, and free. Um, 
that, that's, that's uh, basically where I've put them. Um, if I was to suggest uh, bringing that out into the wider community, I'm sure there'd be a discussion of where the best place to put them is. Uh, but that's the one that made most sense to me when I was going through and implementing it. Uh, well, well, go back. Um, slight problem I encountered here. Um, uh, like I said, we're shipping D in DLLs. Uh, and uh, we, need, we needed to hook up uh, our functions for the garbage collector to use uh, at DLL initialization time. Uh, and this is uh, not, not particularly easy to do when you're calling it from C++ code, so we ended up having to stagger our uh, DLL initialization to some degree. You get the DLL process attach. Uh, actually, I've got the uh, example up on the next slide, but if you guys can't really see that, I'll just uh, try and explain it anyway. Um, <clears throat> if you've done DLL programming, there's an entry point, DLL main up the top. Uh, four different uh, reasons you will enter that function. The first one there is DLL process attach. Uh, a normal DDLL will immediately call the uh, corresponding DLL process attach function in the D runtime. Uh, but that would actually go through and uh, allocate using the garbage collector. And uh, it needing to know, uh, uh, not uh, just, I mean, like the it being used through the garbage collector, the raw alloc and free functions. Sorry, I got that a bit mixed up. Um, I'll say that again. It, it will go through and do uh, normal allocations. So we'd go through our raw functions, which uh, at that point didn't have the necessary function pointers. Uh, so it would try to allocate using a null function, and you'd have a crash. Uh, so the, the uh, setup I had, it's not an ideal solution by any means, but it was a staggered setup. Uh, on the DLL process attach, uh, take a copy of the instance handle. Immediately after in the C++ code where you've called load library, you resolve a, a setup function and call it immediately with uh, your uh, function pointer parameters. That'll then go through and set the correct functions and then call DLL process process attach. Um, but again, that's, still, it's, it, that's not an ideal solution by itself, but it was made even more problematic um, uh, by the other two reasons you'll get into uh, DLL main, which is thread attachment. Every thread in your system upon DLL initialization will hook into it and set itself up using the DLL thread attach calls. And uh, that, that still was problematic because it would also allocate memory, uh, which would call those null functions, which would just be eh. Hello, we've got a question down here. Um, you're doing a final switch on a ulong? Say again? You're doing a final switch on a ulong? That, uh, it, I believe I copied that code originally from an example file. That, that's just how it was when I got it. All right. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, know, I know what your point is, but yeah, like, like I said, that's how I got it. So I just didn't think to remove it, and it worked without it, so it just slipped through the cracks. Um, but yeah, um, uh, where was I? Um, yeah, if dealer, if threads would go through and attach themselves, allocate memory, null error. So, so what it ended up meaning uh, was to, to get the game shipped, uh, you, we'd have to move D uh, module initialization to right at the beginning of the program when there was one thread active, uh, which uh, in, the, in the ship form, that effectively means that you can't really do our uh, hot reloading of DLLs. Because uh, uh, when you do the hot reloading, there's like 40 threads active, and then you get back to the same problem. Uh, so that's, uh, there's, there's definitely solutions to be had there. Uh, one of them in particular, because it's all D runtime stuff that's allocating, is uh, uh, the idea of, uh, like the uh, Windows CRT lives in a DLL, we have the D runtime itself live in a DLL. Um, and I was speaking to Benjamin, where are you in the audience? Up the back there. Uh, he, he was doing some work into uh, porting uh, the D runtime to a standalone DLL, uh, which would go ahead and solve some of these problems. Um, but I got swamped and I didn't end up following up with him for that, so we didn't ship with this proper solution. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> Uh, but need needless to say, some of the challenges uh, that will be involved in that, it uh, sounds like Ben will be going into in his talk tomorrow. Uh, so, anyway, with this current setup, uh, thanks to the lack of hot reloading, it does mean that, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we've been trying to set it up so we can hot reload, but as it's shipped, it's an impediment to the workflow. So I'll, I'll be solving that at some point in the very near future as well. Uh, ne next on the agenda was a, uh, the garbage collector itself. 
Uh, uh, like, uh, we use natural language features, so we, we invoke new uh, people go through the garbage collector, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, the thing with gar in the garbage collectors, uh, as implemented out there, is uh, like, as a game developer, uh, any spikes in, in performance are generally considered bad. These are things that we think require optimization. Um, the monolithic garbage collectors that do that cleanup pass and destruction and cause you know, multi-millisecond uh, uh, things are a bit of a problem for us. Now, it's, it's that, that's not to say we're against garbage collection. Um, uh, oh, I do have slides here that I was meant to go into. Um, uh, well, like, we're, we're completely fine with garbage collection, but we're just not fine with the uh, performance implications of the, uh, uh, of the destruction phase. Um, it's also far stricter memory requirements that we have than your average program. A lot of our data needs to be aligned on solid boundaries, especially where middlewares are involved. They, they expect their memory to be set up in certain ways. Um, cache coherency and fragmentation is a massive problem for us. We are a completely open world streaming game. Uh, so so any, anything that uh, makes data get out of order or out of boundary alignment, we, we need to pay attention to that. Uh, the, the traditional memory model we have as a result uh, of all these problems we need to be on top of is that we actually have and budget for a construction and destruction phase for all our objects. Um, oh, that is terrible colors. <laughs> it looks fine on my monitor, trust me. Um, uh, but, uh, but basically what I've got up here is a little illustration of a core game loop. Um, uh, uh, this is a pretty common setup uh, in game engines across the industry. Um, it, and uh, it, I'll just read it out because it is hard to read. So it's just this little box that collects the core game loop. First one up there, OS services, other miscellaneous stuff like input and all that. Uh, the resource uh, slash object initialization and deinitialization will come next. Uh, after that, we do the actual simulation update. That's where physics and all that happen. There'll be a UI update. Uh, and then finally, uh, we need to prepare the scene for render. And uh, all of this needs to happen on the Xbox One for Quantum Break 30 times a second. On the Windows, um, we've ha we have it running at 144 frames a second internally. It needs to do that loop 144 times, uh, times a second. And that's something like uh, or six or seven milliseconds that it needs to do an entire frame in. Uh, so any kind of spike with destructing objects in that kind of situation is very bad. Uh, it, it leads to frame rate stutters. It leads to no smoothing. It, it's, it's just not an ideal solution for us. All right. So... Um, we didn't really solve garbage collection as a result. Um, uh, now, when it, when it comes uh, to garbage collection, game developers generally tend to prefer something like uh, automatic reference counting as a result. I was speaking to Rainer earlier. Uh, he was mentioning uh, deferred uh, reference counting, which is kind of similar. Uh, I'll have a look into it anyway, because it sounds like it could be useful. Uh, but either way, what we expect, thanks to the fact that we budget it, uh, is that uh, when you assign null to a pointer and uh, everything is lost a reference to it, destruction happens immediately then. Uh, and, you know, that'll mean we get our memory back. It'll mean uh, middleware um, it will destruct all its objects accordingly. We won't have floating objects around that are just waiting for a garbage collection pass. And again, that's especially critical in a streaming engine because you're constantly trying to get data out of the system and back in to replace it uh, to convince people that you're actually in a seamless world. Um, so I, I actually attempted to uh, go into the DMD front end and put some kind of support in for uh, automatic reference counting myself. Uh, the idea I was having is that I wasn't particularly uh, interested in tracking objects. I was just interested in tracking what had a reference to a block of memory. And the idea I had there was that you, you need to know when a pointer acquires a range of memory and you need to know when it unacquires that range of memory. Uh, and, you know, uh, learning the compiler was new code, finding where it did all those pointer acquisitions and unacquisitions. Uh, I mean, I'd been working on it for a week, and I'd finally found five different places. And at that point, I wasn't convinced that I'd found them all. Um, it, it also meant that, uh, you know, it, I would need to learn the compiler even more and e uh, even better uh, if a problem came up with the system I was implementing. Uh, which would be an even bigger time sink for me. Uh, so um, I, um, 
I ended up just uh, putting it to the side. Uh, I, do in I would like to come back and visit it, but it sounds like a, with the garbage collection uh, being a thing lately, um, that I, I might contribute to those uh, discussions instead. Uh, but yeah, either way, it's something to think about for the future. All right, so um, this is, a, again, leading into that catch-22 I mentioned earlier, where not many people were using D, couldn't schedule myself the time to fix the problems. It did mean that we got uh, to the end of the project without having a robust solution for garbage collection. Uh, so the solution uh, that I had to ship the game with uh, was that we just allocate a block of 32, memory, uh, 32 megabytes to the garbage collector. Um, and we never do a collect pass on it, and it increments itself in eight megabyte chunks. Now, uh, despite everything I just said, because of the, uh, the uh, not so much usage of D in our program, uh, that, that kind of uh, meant we could get away with it. Like, you can uh, legitimately run through the game twice and not run out of that 32 megabyte pool. And uh, because the uh, data structures we were using weren't holding on to any resources from middlewares or whatever, it, did, it meant we didn't really have to destruct them. They were just data sitting about memory at that point in time. Um, yeah. um, and yes, it is quite clearly rubbish. I make no attempt to hide the fact. It, it's terrible, it's trash, it needs a proper solution. And in fact, <laughs> Uh, there's a metric that uh, me and some colleagues have been kind of jokingly using lately to track, uh, to track memory usage, and that's the PlayStation 2. Uh, basically, the PlayStation 2, it's, what, a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old machine now. It had 32 megabytes of memory available to it. Uh, to get around the fact that we didn't have a robust garbage collector solution, we figuratively used a PlayStation 2 to get around it. Uh, that, that's commonly known as a hack. <laughs> All right, uh, but anyway, that, that was uh, most, of the, most of the runtime issues dealt with. We could ship, it, we could run code, it was stable. Okay, great. But, you know, you still need to ship on the platform you're going for. If anybody's done uh, iOS or any other kind of uh, storefront development, you know there's, uh, uh, there's requirements that your program needs to go through to uh, uh, be able to be sold. Uh, I can't really go into the Xbox One requirements, but I can go into the uh, requirements for the uh, Universal Windows platform, um, which is effectively uh, a bit of an extension of the Windows runtime API that they introduced with Windows 8. Um, it it's, uh, still needs work. Uh, I got it in a shippable state. Um, uh, but I still need to get in there and do some things with it before I can consider making a pull request to the D, uh, to the, uh, D runtime mainline. Um, there are a couple of simple things uh, that we could deal with in there quite easily, though. The uh, load library function uh, does not exist in a UWP. Uh, you instead need to call load package library. Uh, what that means is... Um, uh, your UWP program data, they all exist in a sandbox. So it's, it's a single package that it looks like to the users. Uh, so, and, and you're not allowed access outside of that sandbox uh, unless the user explicitly gives you permission. And they're not going to do that just to load a game. So you have to package your DDLLs in there. And then you have to go through load package library as a result. <clears throat> uh, what else did I have here? We had... oh. That was something that came up uh, as a bit of a tool chain problem. Uh, Visual Studio, by default, it's got the right click on your project deploy. It'll create that package for you. Now, uh, our uh, uh, solution for Quantum Break is set up with uh, a number of different projects inside it. Uh, all of our uh, code is in its own separate libraries. There's AI, there's uh, physics, uh, there's, there's inputs in its own separate library, and, and, and we've got the DDLLs as well. And I figured, you know, like, the DDLLs, they, they all live in their own project as well, so I figured, okay, this should be simple. Mark up the output from the D files as data, and the system should just go through and automatically pack it in, except it doesn't. What happens is that it only includes data from the project you're deploying from instead of any of the projects marked as dependencies. 
Uh, so, so to get around that, that basically meant that all the output as data we had to explicitly link into the project uh, and then deploy it from there, which is really not an ideal solution. And it's something that the uh, Visual Studio team should be made aware of and uh, uh, look at fixing. Um, I've been told lately that they do quite like game programmers because we do interesting things to their compilers. So uh, that, that's certainly one we can try pushing past them. Now, this is a fun one I found. Uh, there's a tool uh, that I should have mentioned when you're doing a UWP program. It's called WAC, which stands for uh, a Windows App Certification Kit. It'll parse over uh, your code, you give it your symbols, it'll work out what functions you're calling and tell you which ones you're not meant to call. Inside standard date time, uh, one of the functions to determine the uh, time zone, uh, in fact, uses uh, registry calls to do so. Uh, th this is uh, something that I don't know why it was doing that. There is, in fact, a uh, function, get time zone information, that gets this information for you through an accredited API that you're allowed to use. You have no access to the registry in a UWP app. Um, and the funny thing, in fact, is that it pulls the this code in standard date time, pulls the data out of the registry, and puts it into the structure that that get date time zone function requires. Um, so <laughs> I have no idea why it was done like that, but that one is certainly needs a fixing. Um, uh, the one that I didn't solve, though, uh, core sys window thread aux needs a new implementation. Virtually every function that it calls in there to the Windows API, get module handle, there's stuff in there for thread local storage. Um, anything like that is not allowed in UWP. Um, I didn't quite have time. I didn't particularly uh, get to finishing that. I, I got it in a working state, which is basically uh, it's it's there. Uh, we've defined out the functions that will be called, and it just kind of works because we only ever run D code from the uh, uh, thread that we loaded the DLL in on. So any of the and we don't base basically don't use any of D's built-in threading features. So we're able to sidestep that problem. Uh, and, and again, that's also uh, quite clearly rubbish, and it needs fixing. Uh, uh, but I have um, looked into it since. Oh, Walter, yes. Um, just a specific and a general comment. The specific is you found a bug, and you even found a fix in std.datetime. So you need to post it on Bugzilla. <laughs> that's the plan. I, I, okay. I. I I've been, I cannot begin to tell you how busy I've been for the last six months of the project. Um, I've been not only recently come back from holidays as well. I haven't had a time uh, to do a lot of these things, but absolutely one, uh, we do intend on um, either submitting pull requests or, like you said, Bugzilla's for that. Even just Bugzilla, and it's a generic comment I make at least three times a week. If you have found a bug, in it, post it on Bugzilla, or it won't get fixed. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's it's, it's not going to get fixed. I, I do know. plan on following this up. Um, sorry, it, um, I I've had I had no spare time for the last six months of the project. It was ridiculous. Um, okay. I, I might tell you how ridiculous it was later, but it was it was not a pleasant experience. Uh, I had no life at all. Mm -hmm. But the game got shipped. That's that's the important bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to use that function, but I could not find that function. And I think Stack Overflow, they told me there was no such function. <laughs> and the only way to do it was to read the registry, which is why I did it. Okay. I had no interest in doing that, but it was the only solution I found. Okay, so, well, well, it turns out... If you out found the actual way to do it, please tell me. Yeah, well... <laughs> It, like I said, it turns out there is a function. I, I've got it written down in the slide here, so I know it's there. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's, it, it will, it, the point is that it will get pushed out and fixed. This is just one of those things I found trying to get it ready, and I haven't had time to follow up on anything. This, this is the first time I'm following up on it, in fact. So. All right, so um, I think that was the last of the things that I found. Uh, we needed a new... Oh, yeah, that's right. The, um, the, new, Windows, uh, the new Windows API for threading, uh, it, it's... Uh, Part of the uh, WinRT interface, which means everything is in a handle and you have to use uh, C++ CLL, I is your language. But after a bit of digging, it turns out that handles are just com pointers that the uh, compiler manages for you. So actually getting uh, the new threading interface up and running there shouldn't be too much of a hassle. It's just something we need to sit down and do. 
Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, that, that was, it wasn't too difficult uh, at the end of the day to get stuff up and running. And it does, in fact, mean that now that we've shipped, we are the first AAA game uh, with Decode uh, to ship on Xbox One and Windows 10. <laughs> Was it worth it? That's a big question that was asked in, in the post-mortem. Um, now, the general feel from the team, though, was that the little usage we had of D, um, thanks to all the boilerplate stuff I had to do, um, it wasn't really worth uh, the time that it took away from me to maintain the back end of that. And again, that's, that's not a fault of the language. Uh, that is absolutely a fault of the plugin system. If we had chosen to statically link D instead of supporting all the hot reloading and all that other functionality, we wouldn't have had uh, you know, weeks or months of my time spent on the system and D debugging it every time the compiler, uh, compile time stuff went wrong. Uh, but that's also a catch-22 itself. If we didn't want to do rapid prototyping, we would not have looked at D. Uh, it's, it's, it was purely one of those right place, right time things for getting D involved there. And any other circumstance, we wouldn't have used it. But the way we chose to do it, it ended up, yeah, people thinking, maybe not so much. However, though, there is a high amount of interest for future use uh, of D. Uh, I mean, like, uh, people who use it generally tend to like it in the company. Um, uh, and there's a lot of stuff uh, as a result of all the, uh, uh, like the hot reloading and all the uh, code generation capabilities in it that people are interested uh, in doing going forward in the future. Uh, so one of the ones that I kind of want to look at myself um, is to actually use the threading capabilities of D correctly. Uh, a, threading boundaries are basically built into the language. Uh, if we want to do similar kind of threading boundaries in D that we, in C, that we have in D, that, and we do it in C++ instead, that requires a stupid amount of syntax, manual validation, stuff that I don't even want to get into. And frankly, programmers wouldn't like using. You know, they, don't, they don't like using things that are obtuse. Um, and it seems to me, uh, though, that... Um, with these language features set up. Uh, basically, in the future, we plan on going to a task-based system, which means, uh, it, it, just as a quick summary, functions that operate, uh, assuming they're not threaded, they need to work in their own contained space. Uh, this is basically lessons I've learned from the PlayStation 3, and also with the mind for uh, looking into the future for cloud computing and writing code that we can just run on the cloud and ship uh, results backwards and forwards uh, 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 between you know, uh, the local machine and the cloud. Um, and it se seems to me uh, that getting everything up and running and usable um, would be easier in D in that respect, uh, especially with the serialization stuff that I uh, touched on in here. Um, the AI team spoke to me uh, last week. They want to uh, script behaviors with D. They currently use a, uh, a what did I say there? Uh, a a state-based virtual machine uh, to define behaviors, and they link it all up in a pretty UI uh, with, with uh, flow diagrams and all that. Um, but, but they, want, they uh, want something a bit more powerful. Uh, so the idea there would be that they can create behaviors through their UI and, def and uh, they still have it linked up in their state machine or whatever, but the behaviors would be code snippets uh, that, that a code generator would uh, generate code around, and then you would use that instead. So that, that's, that's one that uh, is on the table, and we'll be having a lot more discussion in the next month or two. Um, one of the things that was on the table for D was that the render team and some of the uh, effects uh, authors constantly were saying, uh, you know, we want, we want to do stuff in D. The, um, uh, things like particle systems, uh, they used our own internal scripting language, uh, which uh, it, it, it works, it shipped games, uh, but, but D gave it a lot more flexibility. Um, so I guess speaking of the scripting, I should get into that a little bit. Uh, the internal language is also used by level designers, and um, it, it, it lacks modern features. And by modern features, I mean loops. Uh, I <laughs> 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 you do not want to see the hacks that they have done to get around the fact that we have no loops in the language. Uh, it also critically lacks a debugger. I've had to debug the uh, VM code internally just to work out what's going wrong in some scripts. And that's, that's like you know, an hour out of your day just trying to work out where exactly it's gone wrong. Um, yeah, so um, that's, uh, 
the original reasons that we made the language so restrictive, I mean, I think this language has been around since Max Payne. It was very definitely used in Alan Wake, was kind of trying to limit the damage people could do with the system. But that's not so much of a problem anymore, because we have some highly skilled people using our scripting system. Uh, several of them have computer science degrees. Uh, one of them uh, was on the uh, Oscar-winning visual effects team for Gravity, for example. Um, <clears throat> we've also got a guy that does uh, independent games in his own spare time and gets nominated for major awards, so uh, the skill level in there is quite high. Uh, so, uh, go back. So my, my thinking there is, uh, why, why do we even need a scripting language at all uh, if we already treat a, an actual proper language as data? Uh, uh, the code generation features mean that we can fill out everything that our, everything custom that our scripting uh, language supports natively. Uh, not much of a problem there. It's just a question of uh, whether people want to use it and whether it's considered the time cost for setting it back up at this point. Uh, so that's another discussion we'll be having in a very near future. Um, and another big question, is D ready for AAA gaming? Almost. Almost. I mean, it's undeniable. Uh, we've shipped the game. But I've already outlined a couple of things that uh, you know, we didn't quite solve. There's a few things that we need tightening up there. Um, yeah, some kind of support for uh, ARC garbage collection. would yeah, I'd love that myself. So uh, other game developers as well would be into that. Official con console support is a big one. Um, like, like we, uh, the, uh, if we do runtime modifications, uh, we can't exactly release them to the public, for example. So rather than having everybody do that work over and over again, uh, we, ne we need to work with the platform holders to have an official D environment in in inside uh, their little ecosystem so that accredited developers can hop onto the bandwagon easily. Uh, PlayStation 4 support is especially going to be critical there. We're, we're one of those anomalies in the gaming industry where we've basically, we've shipped on Microsoft platforms, uh, but virtually every other company in the AAA space is a multi-platform developer. If they don't have PS4 support, they're not going to pick up D. Uh, again, uh, with Benjamin's stuff, single instance of the D runtime for the entire application would be very beneficial. Uh, especially, like I was saying, we have multiple DLLs. Uh, I think our binary size that we ship the game with was something like 50 to 60 megabyte of code. Uh, that's all split up into, um, uh, there's a lot of middleware overhead there as well, but that's all split up into DLLs. So having a single instance of the runtime there would also solve it if people start heavily using D and uh, get into the multi-DLL usage. Um, another thing. Uh, been discussing and occasionally raising it every now and then in the company for open sourcing our binding system. Uh, the, it, my intention there is to go, hey, game developers, here's D, and here's some code we prepared earlier to make it use, easier for you. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, we do intend on open sourcing our binding system, uh, getting some more support out there for D in general, and. Uh, uh, hopefully getting contributions to it. It, it certainly means that um, the platforms supported by the mining system aren't dependent on platforms that Remedy needs to ship a game from if we have uh, community support or even other companies within the industry supporting it. And uh, that's about it for me. Does uh, anybody have any questions? Man over there. Um, so you were mentioning uh, the problem of generating uh, C++ bindings. Did you look into Clang for that? Did, it, did we? I looked into Clang for the order generating Clang. bindings. Um, Manu could probably speak more on that a bit more. Uh, back, back when we were first implementing compilers, he had a, what is it, GDC in there? Uh, did you have Clang in there back in the day? Yeah, it didn't really work back in the day when we were first implementing it. Uh, and uh, Manu uh, worked with the... Uh, Ah, sorry. Yeah, that's how, yeah. Uh, well, all our code generation. So, sorry, I, I, it's a bit echoey up here, so I can't hear clearly. Uh, but we're not currently using Clang. We definitely like to use it going forward into the future. Like DMD does our code generation at the moment. And again, with the PS4 support, that, that one's going to require Clang, or LLVM, I should say, specifically. It'll require LDC as the front end. Man down the front. Yeah, so how many developers are actually engaged in the development of projects for kind of so, so the microphone. 
Yeah. Okay, so the question is, how many developers are actually directly engaged with like decoding, like in the project, were engaged, and how many just like take it as a black box plugin thing that just works? Are you talking about D specifically, or? Uh, yeah, like exactly like writing D code. So how many people are? Uh, there were like, me, two, three, four. Five or six people actively writing D code, uh, thanks to the animation stuff. Um, uh, I, I really think there should have been more, but some of the reasons I uh, went into there, uh, why there wasn't. Um, but ideally, I think we got something like uh, how many? Uh, I think we had uh, 30 programmers on Quantum Break at the end of it. I'd personally love it if all of them were working in D. I, I, yeah, I grow more and more disillusioned with C++ by the day, personally. So the sooner I can get away from it, the better. <clears throat> Any other questions? Oh, that appears to be it. No, one more. Uh, Just wait for the mic, mate. Um, what feature besides the um, serialization or deserialization do you like most in D, and what did you use most in D? Um, what you can't do in C++? Well, well the, thing, the thing I found that is the uh, feature killer with D is it's all, all this compile time code evaluation and all its uh, code generation capabilities. Um, I, I can't really think of anything to add for that, but then again, I haven't thought about uh, using it in a deep manner since I originally wrote that code. Uh, I do find it incredibly useful uh, uh, just for little things. Uh, I cut a couple of slides from this presentation that showed off a little thing that was just a nightmare in C++, but you know, very simple in D. Um, Marnie, you had your hand waving. I assume related. Reflection. Yeah, the, the reflection capabilities especially are uh, fantastic in D. Uh, uh, like I was saying, our OSP system is set up in C++ because it doesn't have reflection. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, I, I'll just uh, say a little thing. Like Normally, you know, I'd have somebody in the company say, OK, what can I do in D that I can't do in C++? Every time I tell them, you can save time. That, that, that's the big thing with it. And a lot of the coding you can just set up and just works behind the scenes that requires no programmer maintenance at all. No programmer boilerplate code is, is insane compared to C++. Any others? No. Okay, well then I guess that's it. <laughs>